Well, good morning. Uh, we're still trying to get used to uh, some of this technology. Uh, uh, and the more feedback you give us as we move forward on these meetings, uh, the better we'll get at it. So uh, if, if there's something that we're not doing quite right, please forgive us. But I'll start by uh, talking about the, this is our second hearing. We did a hearing yesterday related to some of the healthcare issues in COVID-19 and that got great feedback. I will tell you all that I was able to, to share that with the governor and his chief of staff uh, and they appreciated some of the things that were sent in their way as well. So this is very important as we're trying to battle COVID-19. Uh, as a quick review, anyone who didn't hear yesterday's proceedings, the working group was formed to review and discuss the state's response to COVID-19 and to vet requests by the governor and proposals by the legislature to address COVID-19 needs and resources. The working group will also review the previously passed funding and bills to provide oversight. As a working group, there are no expected votes. Our intent is to utilize online resources to make COVID-19 discussions available to the public. We hope to find opportunities for testimony from the public, expert witnesses and stakeholders, and then document the engagements that we have and review bills and proposals to address the COVID-19 threat. The working group is comprised of 11 members uh, and I will serve as chair. In addition to me, we have Senators Benson, Chamberlain, Champion, Cohen, Kent, Marty, Pratt, and Rosen. We will also have one rotating member from each caucus group. Today's hearing is focused on the significant economic impacts of COVID-19 and the current state of Minnesota's business. Our discussions will include updates on the state unemployment system, and we will hear from the business community. Senator Draheim and Rest will be joining us for this meeting today as well. At this time, I'd like to turn uh, the conversation over to Senator Pratt to moderate our discussion with testifiers from the Department of Employment and Economic Development, the Minnesota Federal Reserve, and uh, Minnesota Chamber and several, several other small business owners. And then I'll wrap up the hearing with a preview of our planned upcoming working groups and what my takeaways are from this meeting today. Thank you. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Senator Gazalka. And, and I wanna thank all of our participants and uh, folks on Facebook that are joining us today. Uh, welcome Senator Rest and Senator Draheim uh, to the meeting today. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is certainly a healthcare crisis that we haven't seen since the Spanish flu outbreak of, of uh, 1918, uh, 102 years ago. The pandemic has also had significant impacts on our economy both at the state and national level. We have record numbers of people out of work. Nationally, 6.6 .6 million people filed for unemployment just last week. Uh, I'm happy to uh, welcome Commissioner Grove today from, from DEED to give us an update. Uh, Commissioner Grove and his team have been at the center of the non-medical issues that the administration has had to react to. And, and quite honestly, I think his team has really done a, a fantastic job of, of putting in a lot of extra overtime, uh, handling volumes that no one could have ever foreseen uh, coming through in issues that we, we couldn't have anticipated. And then following that will be uh, uh, Fed, Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari to provide an overall assessment uh, and the Fed's perspective. And I think President Kashkari is, is going to be particularly insightful since he was on the front lines of the 2008 financial recession and uh, that his thoughts will be able to help us uh, locally. Uh, next will be Laura Bordelin uh, with the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce, uh, Mandy Ruley uh, with uh, Minnesota Play Cafe, uh, Tim Mallory of the Minnesota Nursery and Landscape Association, Janet Leonard with uh, the owner of Styles on Cliff, and then Joel uh, Vickery with the uh, Vickery Distillery. And so, uh, mm. We've got a, a full agenda, so I invite uh, uh, Commissioner Grove um, to, to go ahead and kick us off. And thanks for joining us, Commissioner. Well, thank you, Senator, and thank you, Senator Gazelka and Senator Rosen and others who've put this together. I think it's a, a great idea and a, a phenomenal chance for us to continue our conversations. I think Senator Pratt and I talk at least once a day, I would say sometimes more, and it's just been a really great way for us to collaborate through some truly unprecedented times as the Senator just outlined for everyone here. 
know, I thought I'd give a little bit of an update of what the state's response has been thus far, give some numbers to give you a, a sense of kind of the, the place that we're at today. And then uh, throughout, though, please interrupt and ask questions as we go forward, because I'm eager to hear what is on the minds of, of this group. So, you know, I think the first topic we wanted to tackle is just unemployment insurance, this program that has been with us since the mid 1930s, but has never seen as many applicants as it sees today. We currently have over 300,000 Minnesotans who've applied for unemployment insurance. Um, our numbers this week are slightly down from last week, but we're still pulling in about 20,000 new applications every day. And we've pulled in more applications in the last two weeks than we did in all of 2019. So that trends with, I think, what's happening in a lot of other states. And I guess to, to talk about what we're doing there, it might be helpful to think about it in three phases. The first phase was just to open up the program to those affected by COVID-19. And so you saw the governor's executive order 2005 that ensured that uh, those who wouldn't have usually had access to unemployment insurance, given the way that the law is written, do have access to it now, given this global pandemic. Uh, the federal laws and, and the state laws that make unemployment insurance available uh, to those who are separated from work from no fault of their own didn't always anticipate or didn't anticipate global pandemics being one of those factors. And so that executive order that the governor signed into law that the Senate and, and House then uh, brought forward in the session from last week was a critical first step in just making sure people had access to the program. Phase two, which was you know overlapping phase one really was just how do we get our unemployment insurance program ready to handle that extraordinary incoming of applications that I talked about a moment ago. Because remember when we, we hit this this moment a few weeks back. We were at uh, we were at staffing levels and capacity levels in that program that matched an unemployment rate that was about three percent. So, you know, we didn't have the staff. We hadn't ramped up staff over time to prepare for um, such a pandemic because, of course, we didn't see it coming. And you want to be efficient with your spend and, and keep staff numbers low when the unemployment claim numbers are low. So we've had to retool the program really overnight. And in the past few weeks, we've added an additional. 50 staff to help process claims. We've opened up the number of hours that the application system is open from 60 to 84. We have instituted a new application and benefit request schedule that moderates that influx of applications so that our customer service approach can be even better. Usually the state of Minnesota has a wait times on the phone lines of about 30 seconds or less. We're one of the fastest in the nation. Those numbers ballooned immediately to over an hour, and by shifting our application schedule, we were able to get that back down to about 20 or 25 minutes. So uh, that's been a good a good shift for us. Um, we've doubled the number of servers that we use in the program so that the website stays up. So many states' websites are crashing. Uh, ours has not, um, and we're continuing daily to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, but with a load, it is a very real challenge that we've had to, to address. And then we're just pushing out many, many informational resources for people on how to use unemployment insurance. 85% of the people who are applying have never applied before. They never thought they would ever need to apply for unemployment insurance. And so there's just a big kind of public education effort here, too, on a program that most folks have heard of, but most folks haven't had to apply for. So that's really been phase two. And then, you know, phase three, which I know is on so many people's minds now, is how do we integrate those new federal benefits into our system. Because as you saw with the CARES Act, we now have an additional uh, $600 per person per week who applies for unemployment insurance through July 31st. We also have, we're also opening up unemployment insurance to self-employed individuals and independent contractors. So that expands the scope of the program. Um, we are extending benefits by 13 weeks and then there's additional reimbursements for employers. And so these are all things that require technical builds and guidance from the federal government as well. Um, we believe we're pretty close on the $600 a week piece, um, so that you'll be hearing about more from us soon. Um, the self-employed independent contractors piece, which I think is on top of so many people's minds, is something that we don't have guidance from the federal government from on yet. And you know, the reason that we have to have that is that we don't know how much to pay people unless the federal government tells us exactly how much. The way we calculate UI benefits is based on your past wages. And if we haven't been tracking that on our system, we just don't know what your past wages have been, and therefore we aren't able to understand the amount of benefit we give you. So we are working closely uh, with the Department of Labor around that, but uh, I just want to set expectations for folks that we guarantee you we'll move as fast as any state can once we have that further guidance from the federal government, because we know for so many self-employed individuals, independent contractors, that disaster assistance is critical. And so we want to move fast to make sure that um, the people can get those benefits. So those are kind of the three phases we've been in right now. 
lots of good collaboration with, with the Senate and with the House and with other business leaders. We do a, a morning call every morning at 7 a.m. with over 700 business leaders across the state, chambers of commerce, uh, business owners, others, just to check in on all these issues. Um, we really appreciate the feedback we've been getting from the public and from our colleagues in the legislature. Um, I can talk about small business assistance next, but maybe I'll just pause there, Senator Pratt, if, if it would be helpful to see if any of the panel has questions on unemployment insurance in particular. Commissioner, uh, I do have a question related to the, the self-employed, the, the individual that didn't contribute into uh, workman's comp, just clarification that number one, they're, they're, gonna, they're going to be covered, and then number two, how long do you think it'll be before we get clarity from the feds about how to determine what, what benefits are available? So yes, uh, self-employed individuals and independent contra contractors will be eligible for unemployment insurance benefits based on the Federal CARES Act. Timing, I'm not sure yet. I wish I knew that we ask the federal government that every day. Um, we're hoping it's a matter of a week or two versus longer. Um, but I know they're working furiously on what kind of guidance they can give states on the, on the payment schedules there. But I will say this, that we are building our technical infrastructure now to be able to do it. It's just a matter of getting the, the policy guidance on, on payment amounts. So we'll definitely keep uh, you posted, Senator, and others on, on our progress there. Uh, we have a question from Senator Champion. Uh, thank you, Senator Pratt. Uh, Commissioner, first of all, let me say thank you for your work. You've been really engaged. I've, I've seen you on uh, the, uh, during the governor's briefing. Uh, you've been available for a cross-section of us. So there's a couple questions that I have today that I hope that you will be able to respond to. In particular, I'll just use this time to ask about um, unemployment insurance. It's my understanding, as I know, that usually there are uh, identified individuals and employers who are involved in that program. There's been a, 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 uh, a desire or an action that has expanded that. And, and so I know that there's concerns from individuals who ordinarily are the ones who pay into the insurance. And when that number goes down, they are assessed a number in order to bring it up to a certain threshold amount. Now. I want to clarify that that's true. And then secondly, I've also heard concerns from folks who are in the nonprofit and the tribal communities who are concerned about the large uh, unemployment bills that they may see coming their way, uh, maybe the summer or the fall, since they are considered reimbursers and, uh, for the unemployment system. Can you tell us how you, you're thinking through solutions for those employers as well? That's my question in this area. Thank you again, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Senator Champion. Uh, Commissioner. Yeah, Senator Champion, uh, Mr. Chair, I think uh, it's a great question. So on the issue of nonprofits and tribal governments, part of Executive 20, Order 2005 was to ensure that employers are not gonna bear the burden of us expanding unemployment insurance due to COVID-19. And that applies to any type of employer, any type of uh, organization paying into the system. So. I think it's a very fair question, but we are absolutely not looking to have businesses or tribes or nonprofits profits foot the bill of a global pandemic as it relates to unemployment insurance. So um, rest assured we're covered there. The first part of your question, could you would you mind restating it just one more time? I don't I don't know if I fully understood the the question. Could you it, it was regards to just the, the payment, the benefit amounts that an individual would be entitled to? Senator, is that right? Uh, thank you again. Uh, uh, Commissioner, I actually think you answered it because I, I know that in order for uh, individuals or employees to uh, get uh, uninsurance benefits or unemployment insurance benefits, usually their employer pays into that. Yeah. And yeah. So I'm concerned with, uh, with, with the definition or, or other folks being able to participate in that um, uh, benefit. Uh, what happens when that fund goes below a certain threshold number and then those businesses who pay into it are assessed a fee right. for, in order to bring it back up to its rightful uh, place under law. And so I'm just concerned about whether those businesses uh, who um, contribute to that fund will be the only individuals contributing to it being, you know, replenished for lack of a better word. But I think you answered it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, that's and, right. Senator Pratt, if I just to respond to Senator Champion's question sure. just with a bit more detail, 
for those watching, no one, no individual in the state is required to pay into their own unemployment insurance trust fund. That that is all paid by businesses, as Senator Champion has rightly pointed out. So, yeah, we are not asking for more payments for businesses to top off that fund. Many of you may be asking, you know, what happens if that trust fund runs out? And we are tracking that closely. We are modeling it. And the federal government uh, has traditionally and has indicated as such this time that they provide no interest loans that are probably ultimately forgivable to help replenish states unemployment insurance funds. And especially given they'll be putting more money into those funds via the CARES Act, this is not a concern of ours at this time. So thank you for the question, Senator. Okay, next we have uh, Senator Benson and then Senator Chamberlain. Thank you. Uh Senator Pratt and Commissioner Grove, um, thank you for the stats on what you've done to gear up for this uh, huge wave of unemployed people who are applying, most of them for the first time. We've had some problems um, in our office um, trying to facilitate and actually getting hung up on because the wait times are so long. And this uh, helped me recall that when Minsher was underwater, they actually did an auxiliary call center and expanded the hours and capacity that way. And so I don't know if that's something you've looked into, but I believe Nate Clark, who heads up Minsure now, was there at the time. And so, uh, you know, you're facing an unprecedented amount of work and you've done great things moving forward. But we've been through this before as a state government and it took a little bit of outside support in order to get things settled down. Well, Senator Benson, uh, Mr. Chair, I think it's a great point, and you're absolutely right. Unprecedented times call for an unprecedented response. We're not going to be able to get through this just by holding current staffing levels constant and just trying harder. So you're right. We've added 50 people this week. Uh, we look to add, I think, 25 to 50 more next week. Um, we are, just for people's knowledge, moving a lot of our, our call center employers, employees home. That's something we have not done in the past, but just for Safety reasons and convenience reasons feel that getting that those UI call center folks doing that work from home is important. Um, we're going to be bringing back our broad information lineup again next week, which I think is critical just for public understanding. Um, but I hear you, and I know you're hearing from your constituents that the wait times are hard, that the system is is um, you know new to so many people, and that's that's tough. And I think we're going to do our absolute best to make sure that people understand the system can use it thoughtfully. Um, and that we're, we're paying the right amount of money to people uh, who deserve it uh, in, in a fast manner. And that's our priority. And we're going to continue to work on it. And I think your suggestions are great. Minture is a great example. And actually, we've already been talking to Nate and a few others on ways we can learn from them, too. So I think it's a great, a great flag. Thank you for that. Uh, next, we have Senator Chamberlain and then Senator Draheim. You're on mute, Roger. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Senator Gr uh, Commissioner Grove. You kind of touched on a couple of things. Uh, I was going to ask about the size of the fund, but you said that we don't really have any concern about that running out because we can get loans or money from the feds to put into that account. I, I, just one small technical thing then is what, what is the average, what is the average uh, check that you believe will be sent out just on average? Thank you. Senator Chamberlain, Senator Pratt, I think it's a great question. Um, traditionally, our average payout over the past several years has been $441 per week. Um, and as you know, the way that unemployment insurance works is that you get half of your pay per week up to a max of 740. So 740 is the most you can get a given week. I have not done the, I have not had the team do the numbers on this uh, this week yet, but what they're telling me is that average amount is is going down, simply based on the the, the types of employees that are employing uh, that are applying now, having being primarily lower wage workers. So um, I don't think that 441 will hold as the average, but um, it's not based on any judgment call that we make. It's just based on how we follow those statutes to get people half of their actual pay, up to a max of 740. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Senator Drayheim. Thank you, uh, Senator Pratt and Commissioner Grove. Um, I've had quite a few calls about uh, people that have had problems applying for unemployment. And uh, is there a priority list for people that have an open file versus new filers? Uh, how, are you, how are you handling people that have already opened a file and are, are having issues? Thank you. 
Thank you, Senator. And uh, Mr. Chair, I think it's a great question. Um, some, some benefit accounts are being activated for the first time, and to your point, some are being reactivated is the, the term that we use, and I think that's, that's true. It's certainly easier if you already have an account up because all your information is there and you've given us the contours of where you're at, but when you're facing a new unemployment instance, you do need to update us on what exactly the factors are surrounding that application. So it's not like uh, you don't have to go in there and, and reactivate. You do have to go in there and reactivate your account. Um, I'm not sure what the specific problems that maybe your constituents were facing when they did that, um, but there's a lot of online guides available. If you go to uimn.org, there's a really lengthy FAQ. We update that almost daily because we want to make sure that the questions we're getting, we can create new and effective responses for. Um, I will say that up to now, we've processed 90% of the claims that have come in, so our hit rate is has been pretty good there. We know for some states they haven't issued a single check yet, which is certainly not where we want to be as a state. I think we're moving quickly there. Um, and you know, it's, it's about one to two weeks once you've applied until you see some money. We're trying to get that time down as fast as we can. Some cases are more complex than others, but we know that for many people, they don't have much time before the money runs out. So we, we really prioritize velocity over maybe some other variables, frankly, that you would consider in a given system, just given uh, how precarious the situation is for some. Uh, Senator Graham, you had a follow-up? Yeah, thank you, Senator Pratt and Senator Grove, or Commissioner Grove, sorry. Um, so I, I guess most of the calls are people that are affected by the COVID-19 and have applied, but um, applied at the same time their spouse did, and they're not getting a check where one of the spouse members got a check and they call in and are having a hard time getting an answer on why why that would be. Senator and, and Senator Pratt, I think that's tough. That's hard. I, I can understand you're comparing yourself to your spouse, your neighbor, others who are applying, and that makes this just all the, feel all the more scary and uncertain. Every UI case is different, and that's why answering specific questions is sometimes hard to do without looking into the actual details. And so sometimes, you know, one person's application is going to have some components that are more complex than others. And so, uh, you know, it's not like it's, uh, it's not automated. You know, there, there has to be some human review here to make sure that we're being efficient and effective with our taxpayer and, and trust fund dollars. Um, so the best I can do is, is just say we're, we're working as fast as we can and appreciate that concern and, and know that many people need that money quickly. And just please know that we're, we're working around the clock for, for every Minnesotan to make sure we can speed that process up. Commissioner Grove, maybe just uh, for some of these specific issues that senators might be hearing about, what should they be telling their constituents or, or how should they be communicating with your, your department? Yeah, Senator, it's a great question. I think we, uh, we have UIMN.org up that has a really extensive list of FAQs there. I think people, I know people want a human touch right now. People are in a vulnerable situation and calling into the call center can feel more comforting, but just given the wait times, again, we, we're dealing with more applications in the last two weeks than all of last year. The website's going to be the best, best place to go, so uimn.org. There's also on mn.gov uh, slash deed a pretty extensive phone a friend guide so that if perhaps, I don't know, you're less tech savvy or using the website just doesn't seem as intuitive to you, you can have a friend kind of look at this guide sheet we've listed. It's, it's 27 pages long and includes detailed information on every field you have to fill out. Um, to uh, to give the kind of guidance you need to to your friends or neighbors, so I would I would suggest that people consider doing that as well. The call lines are there. It's just you're going to get in a very long wait line situation, and so the website's the best place to go. Okay, Commissioner, why don't we uh, move ahead with the rest of your update, and then we can uh, field some more questions. Great. Well, thank you, Senator. I wanted to make sure we discussed small business programs as well because we know that. Small businesses are those that are most affected by this crisis, and you know almost half of Minnesotans work for a small business. So this is a, a really important area for us to provide assistance in. You know, I think the the best levers there are always going to come from the federal government. I think we all know that, that the federal government's ability to print money to take out uh, debt just puts them in a, in a much more powerful position to provide assistance to small businesses. And so, you know, the SBA programs are the most important place to focus first. So. Um, what we have done right away is we immediately moved to make Minnesota eligible for the SBA disaster loan program. Um, you can find out more about it at sba.gov, uh, um, but it's just a really important federal program that provides um, 
very low interest loans, uh, up to $2 million um, for fixed terms, first payments deferred for a full 12 months. Um, you can do that 100% online at sba.gov slash disaster. And one of the really key provisions there that I want to make sure all your constituents and those watching know about is the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Advance. And that particular component of this program is $10,000 that you can get more quickly than a lot of other funds and that will be forgiven. So um, when you apply for loans at sba.gov slash disaster, that Economic Injury Disaster Loan Advance or ED or EIDL as it's being called or EIDL um, is, is the fastest money a, a business can get from the federal government. It's 10K. Uh, it is uh, forgivable. And we, we ask that every small business prioritize that first. We know for many people, that's that's the amount of money that can really keep them from teetering into bankruptcy or staying solvent. So that's a key component of that program. Uh, the Paycheck Protection Program is also designed to provide direct incentives for small businesses to keep their workers on payroll. Uh, it provides each small business a loan of up to $10 million for payroll and other expenses. Um, and if you keep all your employees on payroll, the SBA will forgive that a portion of that loan that you use for, for payroll, rent, mortgage, et cetera. Um, up to 100% actually is, is available for uh, small businesses and nonprofits can apply as well. So that's um, we're still getting some more guidance in that. I think the SBA just sent out some additional guidance on it last night. But those are really, really important programs that we encourage uh, small businesses across Minnesota to, to apply for. Um, there's a couple of state programs, and, and Senator Pratt, you know this well because you helped us build them uh, along with Senator Vogel and others. But one of them is a small business emergency loan guarantee program. Uh, this is a program that the legislature uh, and the governor passed last week. I think it's private banks into the market um, by guaranteeing 80% of the loans that an individual would make to a private bank at a time of crisis. Um, so this is an important way to get, to get private sector lenders involved. We have $10 million set aside for that. We think it'll leverage up between, between 20 and 25. I can tell you the latest number, we got 32 more private banks signed up yesterday, so we're up to 40 total banks that are signed up for that program. Uh, you know, it's, it's the private market. So the, signing up doesn't mean they're guaranteed they're going to do it, but at least gets them into the into the conversation and, and, and eligible to do it. Um, and, you know, candidly, we know a lot of the loans that people are going to apply for there are not going to be as attractive, you know, to a bank as typical. So we hope that that 80% loan guarantee amount from the, from the state will help incentivize more of those loans to get made, but we'll see, we'll track it. And I think it's a, an important lever. And the other one is the Small Business Emergency Loan Program that sets aside $30 million for 0% interest loans for businesses affected by the governor's executive orders 2004 and 2008, which uh, paused uh, operations of restaurants, bars, places of public amusement, et cetera, um, that um, really kind of, and, and the governor continued that order through uh, the end of this month to make that, to help them get money they need to, to bridge this gap. All state dollars, just as a kind of broad statement, are meant to kind of bridge the gap between now and when federal funding can come. And that's just important for, I think, Minnesotans to recognize, again, the federal government has so much more available. We don't want to spend your hard-earned taxpayer dollars on something that ultimately is going to get some federal dollar, uh, have federal dollars available for it. And so the trick in this whole thing and the thing that we're all navigating is how do we use state dollars to help stem some of the immediate uh, challenges that are, that are being faced while knowing that federal dollars ultimately are going to be the, the longer term uh, pot of assistance uh, and how, how do we navigate that best for Minnesota. So that's kind of the, the strategic exercise that we're engaged in right now. Um, so I think that's important. Last thing I would just say is this, we have given cities the freedom to open up their revolving loan funds from states so that uh, businesses can go to their cities as well for additional funding. And we freed up an additional $28 million through that provision uh, of the governor's executive order from a few weeks ago that uh, we're already beginning to see cities uh, open up to, to make eligible for small businesses. So again, small businesses are just a huge area of focus for us. We're working very closely. We talked to the SBA multiple times a day. Uh, we're directing a lot of people to head there first and then use those state dollars where maybe the gaps might exist. So I'll pause there and love to answer any questions people might have. Senator Champion, did you have a question? <laughs> I did, thank you so much again. Um, uh, Commissioner Grove, I know that uh, you've expressed, in, at least in my conversation with you, how important it is for us to be available for all businesses 
uh, as much as humanly possible. And I thank you for the work that you've done thus far. But I've heard, um, or I've had some inquiries from some S corporations as well as LLC businesses, business owners about needed financial assistance. Um, it is my understanding the Paycheck Protection Program loan doesn't allow for them to use that money for like sales or liquor or property taxes or any of the other sort of challenges some of the small businesses are having. And of course, as you know, I represent uh, the North Loop in downtown uh, and there's a lot of businesses there. And so it is also my understanding that um, a part of this uh, inquiry is that they, they have to also, or the loan requirement requires that they have to retain or later hire 75% of the staff they once employed uh, to have loan forgiveness. So I'm wondering, what are you considering as a financial tool for these identified businesses and what your thoughts are? Well, thanks, Senator Champion. Senator Pratt, I think this is a, an important area. Again, that, that federal program is a federal program. We don't have influence over it. So um, we're just trying to help Minnesota businesses navigate it as best as they possibly can. And we know that for some S Corp businesses, those, those federal payments that are coming in via the CARES Act that are just direct payments to individuals, uh, you know, will help. Our programs are certainly open to them. And I think, um, you know, we've, we've defined small business intentionally pretty, pretty loosely in our programs. We've said essentially, if you're, if you're one person, you are a small business up to, in some programs, we don't even have a cap on it. We just say of any size, if here are the loans that are available to help you out. And so we're trying to provide as much flexibility as we can where maybe the federal government hasn't. Again, that's kind of the trick is how do we complement and not overlap some of those programs. Um, but I think this is an issue that we want to continue to raise with the SBA, and I know you're raising with them as well, and uh, you know that they're they're navigating throughout that the program that they're they're developing. If I can make a quick comment too, um, if I can make a quick comment, Senator Pratt, can I speak? Next? Yeah, uh, go ahead, Senator Zalka, but we're getting a lot of feedback from you. It's probably my hearing aids. That's better. Okay, what I wanted to say is uh, for the payroll protection program, the best place to go is your, your financial institution. They're getting downloaded all the information, how to, how to uh, complete the application, what's gonna be covered, what's not covered. And so uh, they've get, the federal government has given our financial institutions a lot of authority to get those loans uh, released out to the people that need it. So that's a good place to go. Okay, we have uh, we have ten more minutes with the commissioner. Oh, I'm getting feedback. We've got ten more minutes with the commissioner. So, uh, commissioner, I think you were going to touch on essential businesses, and then uh, we can take any extra time with questions. But I know you've got a hard stop. Yeah, uh, thanks, Senator. I think it's just just useful to touch on at this point. You know, we have been working in close collaboration with the business community across the state to help provide as much clarity as possible on the governor's state home order as it relates to critical industries. And, you know, when we first came out with the order, we were clear about the broad industry buckets that were to be considered critical based on the Department of Homeland Security's guidance. Uh, we then went a step further to help Minnesota businesses understand what that meant by going into um, occupation classifications through something called NAICS codes. Essentially, it's a way to look at what businesses qualify as critical, non-critical based on very much more narrow granular data to give more clarity. We also went further than most states in defining what a critical industry job is. So many states just went with that Department of Homeland Security guidance and called it a day. We ended up getting to a place where about 82% of the jobs in our state are classified as critical. And so you know, the goal here was to create a, a common sense, you know, set of guidelines that identify what a critical sector, critical industry job is in our state today. And, you know, it's one of these things, we're all realizing this as, as life unfolds, that there are so many industries and jobs that you might not have considered critical but then when it comes down to it, you're like, my gosh, those are extremely critical for the functioning of society. I think about like dry cleaners. You know, if police or medical personnel can't get their uniforms cleaned, you know, we're in trouble, right? E even food truck delivery drivers who, you know, that, that seems like kind of a, a fun hipster profession that allows us to eat food in unique, fun ways. Well, look, 
you know, those guys are critical right now. They're getting food out to neighborhoods where there isn't uh, access to, to, to food, and, and they're really on the front lines of this in so many ways. And so these are the kinds of things that, that we're trying to think through. And I will say that it's not a static thing. I mean, we put this guidance out, and then we've gotten like three or 4,000 requests for clarification that has actually shaped our thinking. So I want people to know that your, your government is, is not rigid about this. It's trying to be flexible. It's trying to learn from businesses. And I know, you know, Senator Champion, Senator Pratt, Senator Gazelka, many others on this panel have helped us think this through and have, have raised business concerns to, to us alongside the chambers and other business leaders across the state to try to continue to refine this in a way that's helpful. And I guess the last thing I would just say is mn.gov slash deed slash critical is where you can really go into the details on this. And you know, our Department of Administration, our, our General Counsel, and of course the team at Deed publish almost nightly a new PDF with further, further guidance that we're trying to develop just to keep communication open and, and really clear and available to people. So that's probably the, the, the update worth giving here on, on critical industries. Uh, Senator Rosen, did you have a question? I did. Thank you, Senator Pratt. And uh, good morning, Commissioner Grove. Thank you very much. This is very informative. And I know it's all in very good hands with, with your team and Senator Pratt and Senator Draheim um, working on all these issues. My question is um, about the nonprofits. I sit on the board of the Guthrie and the Minis uh, Minneapolis Institute of Art, and they are thinking of applying for the SBA loans and the paycheck, a paycheck protection program. You said there is up to $10 million in that, that uh, paycheck protection program available. Have, have, has that been utilized yet? And is that going to be enough? Or is that an area that you're thinking that perhaps needs uh, additional funds? I'm really glad you asked that, Senator, because I think it's a, an important question for businesses as large as the Guthrie. You're not a couple thousand bucks isn't going to tie them over, right? They're going to need a much bigger right. loan. It's actually 10 million is the cap that any one organization can apply for. Okay. So yeah, it's you know it's it's pretty pretty generous cap there because we know many nonprofits have large operating expenses. So yeah, and to follow up, that's probably the first time they've ever used that that uh, program. Right. Um, this this is an area, and I know if did if I guess I'm asking if you had any influence on what was shut down with the governor's order, um, and if you are taking a look at what we can adjust in that declaration. Um, specifically, I'm getting I'm getting some um, information from the golf courses, and I know that's been on the topic, but there is there is the issue of keeping them open for the public, which is important that they have an avenue to get out, get fresh air. But there's also the issue of maintenance right. for these golf courses. And I think that's an area we have some wonderful assets. Um, and that asset definition is quite broad in the state, but we do have to protect the assets that we already have in place. So I hope there is some, some uh, rethinking on that declaration for the golf courses. Senator Rosen, Senator Pratt, others, it's a great question on golf courses, and I'm sure you've heard the governor reference this in a couple of the, the press calls. I think he's thinking about this very pointedly for exactly the reasons that you've outlined, Senator. It's not just the, the, the revenue from folks going out to golf at, at a time when that's so such a tradition as, as spring opens up in Minnesota, but also it is the maintenance workers. It's those, those jobs that, that keep a golf course going. I know he's considering it. Yes, we are. I am, and many other cabinet members are advising him on all kinds of fronts there. I think he's He's given some thought to like, you know, if you if you open the golf courses, do you do you keep the groups in two, or do you only allow walking versus carts, say, such that you're not in close proximity? These are the kinds of things we're all trying to figure out. I think golf courses is, is a perfect example, but the broader point is this: whenever stay at home ends and and whenever we our economy ramps back up, this whole guidance on social distancing is going to be critical. And thinking very specifically about the kinds of uh, you know, health guidelines that we give to, you know, a customer facing business or an industrial setting of a business or, you know, an office business, they'll, they'll all be slightly different, but how do we give the right kinds of guidelines to those types of businesses such that they can think through social distancing in a really thoughtful way? And it applies to golf courses, again, as, as much as, as any business, what is the best health guidance that we can give and practical kind of psychological guidance we can give to businesses around social distancing? You know, do you, do you put a sign out front of any given store that that limits the number of people that can come in based on a, a, an analysis of your square footage per person, for example, such that you can have a kind of a common sense guide on what six feet between people could look like? Do you, 
you know, require PPE to be worn in certain stores if customers are coming in. And we've been talking to manufacturers across the state about, you know, can they functionally operate assembly lines and still adhere to social distancing? Some can, some can't. And so they're all kind of, businesses are kind of the laboratory for all this. We're learning from them, quite frankly, on what works and what doesn't. But at this point, social distancing is so important to, to stop the spread. We've got to start with that as the priority and then think through all these practical questions about how it plays out, you know, in different business settings. And we continue to welcome just feedback from, from everybody on that. So thanks for the question. Um, Aaron Champion, did you have another question? Yes, thank you, uh, Senator Pratt. Um, again, Commissioner, uh, I mentioned earlier in my comments to you that I, that we've all watched you with the governor uh, doing the briefing, uh, that you've been uh, doing an extraordinary job of trying to communicate uh, to all of us uh, what we can do for our small businesses, uh, whether it's for unemployment insurance, whatever. And I know that the, the, the message that you are, you are articulating as well as the message the governor is trying to get out is to make sure that all of us in this great state of Minnesota uh, get, gets the information, uh, has an ever-changing and evolving direction as to what's available, what's not available, and getting our questions answered. And you, in fact, said earlier um, uh, when you were looking at the unemployment insurance, that there are people who thought they would never have to use it, and yeah. some didn't even know who D uh, uh, was. Uh, and that's true. That made me smile because I know that to be true. And and that leads to my larger question that you heard me talking about the other day: is I'm growing increasingly concerned that the information and the tools that Deed has available to them, that information is not getting to a cross-section of our communities. I had a conversation yesterday with Asian business leaders. I've been on the phone talking to, you know, uh, uh, other small business uh, uh, leaders who are not getting the information and they don't quite know how to navigate through some of the terrain that, uh, that you have articulated. Um, and, and we know it's really needed. So can you just tell me what strategies are you using uh, that may be traditional or non-traditional strategies to communicate to a cross-section of Minnesotans who also have small businesses and who are also our friends and neighbors who may have a language issue or who may need that communicated differently um, uh, or in a way that they need it communicated. Tell me what you all are doing in order to make sure that a cross-section of, of our uh, Minnesotans are receiving all this valuable information. Senator Champion, Senator Pratt, that is so well said. And I think you've been a really helpful co-conspirator in figuring out what we should be doing there, and we're grateful for that. You know, I, I think many of you may know I, my previous profession was at Google, and before that I was a journalist. So this issue of, of how we get information out is just really personally important to me and something that I spend a lot of time every day thinking about, and our team does too, and, and taking action on, because we have such an information challenge on our hands right now. And uh, we can't just expect people to figure it out on their own or to come to mn.gov slash deed and all their worries will be assuaged and they'll <laughs> the world will open up and it all makes sense. Um, we need to have different communication strategies for different communities using different uh, strategies that work for them, that don't just work for us. So you got to start with the user and think about what your what your user needs out of out of a communication strategy. We are translating a lot of our materials into different languages. Uh, we do that every day, um, and you'll see that both on our unemployment insurance website, but also on Deeds. Uh, we are looking at and engaging now with, with various ethnic media resources, both for paid placements, uh, but also for earned media placements, so that we are uh, getting our content out to those communities uh, consistently and effectively. Um, we launched yesterday the first of a what will become a three thrice weekly um, town hall for community organizations, nonprofits, and other community leaders across the state where we just walk through the latest updates and then just take questions uh, in the same way that we have been from businesses across the state. Um, and, you know, I think you'll see this coming from the, from the state government more broadly in the coming days. We're looking at what is a centralized communication strategy look like for all of state government that is simple, effective, and, and clear. I'd say the last piece of this is just you, you, you can never do enough communicating. 
So you really got to hope and, and ask people to tell their friends and neighbors. You got you to rely on social media. You got to rely on people being advocates on their own, taking the information that we're sharing and, and getting it out to friends and neighbors. For those who are information rich and, and tech savvy, for them to use the, the content that we're sending out there and find other ways to communicate it that we may never even thought of, like that's when you're hitting a sweet spot, right? When people are thinking through other ways for you taking the core of the idea and the message and, and what we're trying to do and then adapting it to audiences organically on their own. And I think that's where we need to get. Are we there right now? I, I don't know, probably not, uh, but we need to work harder at it. And I would ask you to keep pressing us to work harder on it. Ask everyone on this panel to keep pressing us to work harder on it and to give us ideas of ways we can do it better because misinformation is, is a huge problem right now. And we need to make sure we're getting people the information that they need. So thank you for that question. And I think uh, Senator Pratt, I probably am going to stop. So if I could maybe just say a final word, which is to thank everyone on, on the panel here for your hard work. This this very much feels like a collaboration for us at Deed. We couldn't be doing it without your help, without your advice, without your daily calls. I think particularly to, to Senator Pratt and Senator Champion and, and Senator Gazelka, who we talk to so frequently about all these issues. We welcome calls from anybody. Please reach out to us if you have ideas um, or suggestions. Uh, we need to get this right from an economic perspective. And we're really going to do that with your help. So thank you for your, your, your leadership and for having me on and giving me the chance to share some thoughts and ideas here. Thank you, Commissioner. And uh, welcome, uh, President Kashkari. It's nice to have you here today. Thank you, Senator. I appreciate the invitation. Uh, President Kashkari, I, you know, as we talked yesterday, I think you've got an interesting perspective and position as, as far as what we're facing, both uh, locally and nationally. And, would love to get your thoughts, uh, you know, and again, um, your perspective as, as having been through an economic crisis in the past. Sure. Thank you, Senator. And all the other senators, I appreciate the opportunity. <clears throat> as Senator Pratt just mentioned, I was one of the first responders in the 2008 financial crisis, serving under both Presidents Bush and Obama. And having been through that crisis, there are some comparisons to this crisis that people ask me about. Obviously, that crisis started out in the banking sector, in the housing market, and gradually spread into other parts of the economy. This one is first and foremost a healthcare crisis. It's much more like a natural disaster. Think about a natural disaster like Hurricane Katrina hitting New Orleans. Obviously, Katrina was devastating for New Orleans, for the people of New Orleans. But relative to the scale of the U.S. economy, even something as big as Katrina was tiny relative to the U.S. economy. This COVID crisis is actually hitting the entire U.S. economy essentially at the same time. And it's unprecedented, as, as Senator Pratt said, we really haven't seen something like this since 1918, hitting virtually the entire economy all at once. Uh, when I think about the response to it, the first responders clearly, and you know this, are the healthcare workers, the doctors, the nurses, but also the scientists who are working on testing, who are working on vaccines. Everything that you're doing and the federal government is doing to support them is absolutely paramount to give them the ability to catch up and try to get their arms around this uh, virus. The second responders, as I think about it this time, are all of us, the people of Minnesota, the people across the country who are practicing social distancing. The reason that you're all at home, the reason that the Minneapolis Fed has been working from home for the past three weeks is because we want to slow the spread of the virus to give our healthcare system the ability to catch up, to build capacity, to build more ventilators so that we don't overwhelm the healthcare system. The third responders, in my mind, are all of you. It's our state and federal legislators who are taking unprecedented action to try to provide the resources both to the healthcare system, but to small businesses and to workers to try to bridge this, to get through this crisis. And then we at the Federal Reserve, the role that we're playing, we're not the first responders this time, we're more in the background. We are working very hard to make sure that our financial system is functioning so that financial markets are working, so that businesses that aren't directly affected by the crisis, think about, <clears throat> General Mills, a great Minnesota company, or 3M producing masks, or Medtronic producing ventilators, we need to make sure that they're able to raise the money that they need to pay their staff to make the investments that they need to make so that they can continue to function and do the and serve the really important role that they're serving to Minnesota and to the nation. And that's why we're taking unprecedented action to make sure the banking system is sound, to make sure there's enough cash in the economy so that blue chip businesses, large and small, can go out and raise money to meet their basic financial needs. And that's what the Federal Reserve has been doing for the past several weeks, taking very aggressive action to make sure that the financial system is running. 
Now, a lot of people ask me, how long is this going to take? What's it going to mean for the economy? And I, I wish I had a clear answer. It's really going to be determined by the course of the virus and how the healthcare system is able to respond to get their arms around the virus. Our economists at the Minneapolis Fed are looking at the models that the best epidemiologists in Minnesota and around the country, the forecast they have for the spread of the virus. We're looking at the experience of other countries around the world. I'll give you an example. China is telling a very good story that they clamped down on their economy aggressively, they got control of the virus, and now they're able to relax the economic controls and they're turning their economy back on. And I hear from Minnesota's biggest businesses that do business in China that they are turning their factories back on, they're reopening their storefronts. But a question that none of us knows right now is as they relax the economic controls, does the virus simply flare back up again? Because unless China has tested everybody to know who's had the virus and who hasn't, do, are you really confident that you've really got this under control? So we just don't know. We know there are two endpoints ultimately for this. One endpoint is our scientists develop a vaccine. And the best experts have said that's a year to 18 months away. We all hope and pray that it's sooner than that. That would be an end point to this. We can't shut down the economy for a year, 18 months, obviously. Another end point is something the scientists call herd immunity, when the majority of people would have had the disease, most people would have recovered, and then it won't spread as much and the infection rate will be very slow. Angela Merkel in Germany said that 60 to 70% of Germans could end up getting the disease. You would certainly achieve herd immunity at that point, but how many Minnesotans, how many Americans would perish on the way to that? You know, one example that I learned that was shocking to me was that in 2009, almost 60, 60 million Americans contracted the swine flu. Now, fortunately, swine flu was not that deadly. Only, it's still a lot of people, only 12,500 or so Americans died from that. If COVID appears to be much deadlier than swine flu, then obviously many more Americans would perish on the way to 60 million Americans contracting it. So the point of the social distancing, which is so important, we know there are big economic costs, is so that we, you know, if we all got the disease at the same time, we would immediately overwhelm the healthcare system and then people would needlessly die. So that even, heaven forbid, if you or I had a heart attack unrelated to COVID, you went to the emergency room, you couldn't get treatment because they're overwhelmed with COVID patients. That's a way that overwhelming the healthcare system can lead to needless death. So the social distancing is very, very important so that we don't overwhelm the system and we can build capacity uh, to treat more people. But we don't know how long this is gonna take. The best scenario that I've heard from any of the experts is, and it's speculation, is that maybe this uh, COVID will follow the uh, course of the flu and maybe it'll be dormant over the summer. And if it were dormant over the summer, that would enable the healthcare system time to catch up, time to build capacity, so that if it flares back up again in the fall, we don't then get overwhelmed. And so right now, there's a lot more that we don't know about the course of the virus than we do know. Uh, if you look at the financial markets, you're seeing this massive volatility in the stock market every day and in fin other financial markets. That volatility is being driven by the fact that investors also don't know the answers to these questions. And so the, the markets are gyrating as they're trying to guess on the path of the virus, how many people will get it, what is the mortality, how long is this going to take? I would tell you that much of the work that the state has done, you in the legislature with the governor's office, uh, with the commissioner, uh, Commissioner Grove, and at the federal government level are focused on the right things, in my opinion. You've been focusing on making sure that the healthcare system has the resources they need to build the capacity, to do the testing, to treat the patients, that's absolutely paramount. Second, focusing on making sure businesses can retain their workers. You know, one of the things we learned in 2008, we had 10% unemployment nationally, millions and millions of Americans lost their jobs. It took a decade to rebuild the labor market, to put Americans back to work. So anything you can do, and you're already doing it with Commissioner Grove and others, to give businesses the resources they need to keep their staffs employed. If you spend a dollar on the front end helping a small business keep their workers employed, that is much better than having to spend the same dollar on the back end with unemployment assistance. Because once we've laid off, and it's already happening, unfortunately, once we've laid off tens of millions of, of Americans, we've learned that it just takes a long, long time to bring them back into the economy, to reattach them to jobs, to get the economy moving again. 
Last thing I'll say, Senator, and then I'll turn it back to you, Senator Pratt. People have asked me, is this going to be a V-shaped recovery, a quick bounce back, or a long, slow recovery? And we just don't know. It's really going to depend on how long we have the shutdown, which is driven by the virus, and what are the implications for businesses? I'll give you an example. If small businesses are able to return their, uh, retain their workforce and we get through this fairly quickly and they can turn back on, they've already got the workforce ready to go, they can ramp back up pretty quickly. But if, on the other hand, we were to see waves of bankruptcies across the country and across Minnesota, think about the restaurants and the coffee shops and the gyms and the nail salons having to go through the cycle of bankruptcy where you would have storefronts going out of business signs, out of business signs, vacant storefronts. It will take months or longer for new tenants to then move into that space, rehab that space, hire their workforce. That takes a very long time to then get the economy back to where it was before. And a lot of anxiety and a lot of damage as you go through that cycle. And so I would just say, uh, I think you're focused on the right things. And ultimately, a uh, dollar spent, I said a dollar spent retaining workers is better than a dollar spent on the back end. I agree with that. I would also just say anything we can do to support the healthcare system to get their arms around this more quickly, that will directly translate into a shorter lockdown and a faster economic recovery. Thank you, uh, Senator Pratt. I'd be pleased to take your questions. Thank you. Do we have any questions for the commission or uh, for President Kashkari? Uh, Mr. Kashkari, I have a, a, a quick question. So the Fed has a dual mandate of managing the currency as well as uh, uh, trying to get us to full employment. Are you seeing, and, and we've got hotspots in New York, uh, new ones crop in California, new ones cropping up in Florida, uh, and then some of the Southern states, Texas, Louisiana. Are there any regions that, are, that, that you see are, are starting to recover from uh, the COVID-19 spread, and what are you seeing as far as employment and economic activity in those areas, if any? Yeah, Senator, uh, it's it's too soon to know. You're hearing anecdotes of maybe some of the, the, the testing and the cases are slowing the acceleration. I would say, I mean, my humble opinion is I think Minnesota has been aggressive, and I think that is going to serve our state well so that we don't get to the point where we are overwhelmed by this and trying to dig out. I mean, Italy is the worst case scenario that we've seen where the country has been overwhelmed by this. They've had to go for a nationwide hard lockdown and perhaps they're turning the corner on this. I, I think we're much better served being aggressive on the front end than allowing ourselves to get overwhelmed and then trying to play catch up. But I have not yet seen any clear evidence of people turning the corner other than some other countries. But even today, earlier this morning, I read an article that said Singapore is reimposing some lockdowns because they're having flaring, they're having flare-ups yet again. And so, uh, unfortunately, there's a lot we don't know right now. Uh, Senator Rosen, you had a question? Yes, thank you, Senator Pratt. Uh, good morning, uh, President Kashkari. Good morning. So, um, it is a little surprising how quickly the Chinese government and economy is turning around. I think um, there's some reports of up to about 90% activity already. Uh, little surprising how the rest of the the countries are not recovering at that pace can you give us um an idea of why it it's because they the other countries have not put in the measures that that are necessary for that recovery well it's a good question and we're trying to figure that out too i'm i'll be honest with you i'm a little bit skeptical that china is really turning around as successfully as they are saying um you know they they tell a story that they had a very draconian lockdown, which, you know, if you think about it, that should lead you to quarantine and control the crisis more effectively if you're more stringent in your lockdown. That makes intuitive sense. But at the same time, they report that many people had the virus and they were called asymptomatic. They didn't show any signs of the disease. They had no symptoms. So unless you've tested everybody in the region, how do you really know that you've got it under control? And so that's why we're paying close attention as it appears that they're reactivating their economy, does the virus simply flare back up again? We just don't know right now. And the experiences around the world have been quite varied. And so it's, it's a big question for us that we're paying attention to, but I wish I had a good answer for you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Cohn, I think you had a question. Yeah, thanks, uh, uh, Senator Fan, President Kashkari. A uh, couple things. Uh, first, uh, you talked about some of the Fed activity, and it seems to me that 
that as somebody who, who doesn't know that much, that the Fed's been very, very aggressive, maybe more so than, than at any other time. And so the first question is, is there anything else the Fed can do, or at some point do you reach a limit in terms of, of Fed activity? Um, and, and if not, what would you expect uh, in the future? The second is that uh, when you spoke to the Senate Finance Committee uh, several months ago, you emphasized uh, in terms of sort of the growth of the economy, the immigrant communities and, and the need for immigration. And uh, the other thing you talked about, of course, was my generation, the baby boom generation, leaving the job market. I'm wondering about the impact on, on those two areas relative to where we are right now. Yeah, uh, thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Um, Remind me, I'm sorry, I was thinking about your immigration and your uh, uh, the older generation. Remind me the first part of your question. Uh, uh, what, how, much more, how much more aggressive can the Fed be, given yeah, how aggressive you. you've been you know, these last uh, few weeks? Well, you're, first of all, thank you for the observation. We have been much more aggressive in this crisis than we were a decade ago. I think we learned that we had to, it's better to err on the side of being very aggressive to try to cut off some of the worst case scenarios. And I applaud our leadership in Washington, our chairman, Jay Powell, for that leadership. We've done in a few weeks what we did in a year last time, frankly, and so that's right. There's more that we can do, but we can. our basic job in this is to make sure that their financial system is functioning, that companies that have business are able to tap the capital markets to raise the money that they need to make sure that the banks are sound. So we have more tools that we can do to provide that, but that is really a second order issue relative to the first responders and the healthcare system and the work that they're doing whether it's testing or developing vaccines or developing treatment. So we you know, we have a role to play, but we're not at the front and center of this. It really is the healthcare system and then the fiscal authorities, yourselves and your colleagues in Washington. Um, and then in terms of the various groups, the longer term issue, it's, un, it's unquestioned. I mean, we will get through this crisis. We got through the last one. We wanna minimize the pain for American families and for American workers and American businesses. And we will put Americans back to work. And at some point, our population growth becomes a limit on how fast our economy can grow just by the fact that we're having fewer children. And so older Americans in this last expansion were really part of the engine of economic growth because they said, yeah, I'm going to work longer. I'm not going to retire. I'm going to go back to work. And that's been a, a really positive boost for US for the US economy. Uh, that will need, I mean, that those facts will become important again once we put Americans back to work. But right now, with the unprecedented unemployment that we're seeing that's just taking off in Minnesota and nationally, that's going to be less of a pressure point right now. But you know, the simple fact of the matter is population growth is an important driver of long-run economic growth, but it's going to be less of a factor in this, in this acute crisis. Okay, thank you. Senator Chamberlain, or Senator Cohn, did you have a follow-up? Uh, no, that, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Chamberlain. You're on mute, Senator Chamberlain. I'm being a good uh, a good player. Uh, thank you, Senator Pratt, and thank you, uh, President Kashkari. You made an excellent point. I just want to reemphasize it. Uh, the economy has a hard time growing unless we have a growing labor force or increased productivity. Uh, so that underscores the fact that prior to this, we had a challenge with, at least in Minnesota, extreme labor shortages. It kind of begs the question or underscores it, perhaps, that we need to get people back to work sooner rather than later, because uh, this is much different than every every crisis is a little bit different. And this is uh, several shades different than uh, previous recessions or depressions. I just want to underscore that. You can comment if you like, but vitally important to get people back to work as soon as possible, as many as possible because uh, this is much different than previous uh, recessions and depressions. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Pratt, Senator Chamberlain. I agree with you. Uh, again, that's, that's probably one of the biggest surprises from the last crisis is that it took more than 10 years to fully put Americans back to work again. We kept thinking, oh, we're, we're there. The unemployment rate is 4.5%. We're there. Turned out there were millions of people on the sidelines who were not counted as unemployed because they had stopped looking. And so, the, the, what, the more we can do to shorten this downturn and to quicken the recovery, the easier it'll be to bring people back in, which is just the key to not just economic growth, it's also so good for our communities that people are working. Thank you. Do we have any other questions for Mr. Kashkari? Well, 
Thank you, uh, President Kashkari. We appreciate your comments and uh, insights. Um, you know, certainly we are uh, facing unprecedented challenges here as well, and and appreciate having you here uh, locally and your partnership as we move forward. Thank you, Senator. We want to be a resource for you and uh, the the state. So just count on us and call on us anytime. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Laura Bordelon from the Minnesota Chamber. Welcome. Laura. Hey, Senator Pratt, I apologize if the lighting's a little dark. Um, I want to thank all of the senators for inviting the Minnesota Chamber to participate in this meeting. Uh, we have a lot of anxiety across the business community about the impacts of COVID. So I'm going to I'm going to read through some comments and would be happy to answer any questions. But first, I just want to say how um, much the chamber fully appreciates the serious challenges that Minnesota families and workers employers and communities are facing in this public health crisis. And we understand the need for the difficult decisions being made to mitigate and slow the impacts of COVID-19 to protect the health of Minnesota. But as a result of these efforts, many Minnesota businesses have been uh, required to shut their doors or have experienced profound disruption in their business operations and resulting drop in their revenues. And this has had a statewide impact across all businesses of all sizes. Employers are obviously doing everything they can to ensure the health and safety of their employer, employees and customers while trying to maintain the viability of their businesses. And we are very grateful for the loans and grants being made available through, through the state and federal governments. But the biggest challenge for businesses right now is time. Uh, loan applications can be cumbersome and time consuming State and federal employees, we appreciate what they're doing. They are scrambling to be as responsive as possible to businesses, uh, but businesses are shuttered and they're waiting on the sidelines for some help. Um, so for example, the SBA's economic injury disaster loan, they're anticipating a three to four week waiting period to process applications simply because of demand. Um, you've referenced and, and Commissioner Grove referenced the uh, Paytech, Paycheck Protection Program, PPP, it was just passed last week. The guidance was just updated last night. It looks like it's going to be an incredibly important and valuable resource. Um, and given the tremendous industry and demand that we're expecting, we're also expecting delays in getting uh, loans processed. So what employers are looking for is for you to take action now on a short-term basis to prevent further economic hardship and to hasten economic recovery. Um, I want to share with you, we surveyed, surveyed our members last week and just this past week, and we asked them a couple of questions specific to tax payments, and, and I'd like to share with you their responses because I think they're, they're very informative. Um, on income taxes, they've said we are currently staying alive on cash reserves. The longer these payments can be delayed to coincide with economic recovery, the better. Another member said we have lost 80% of our revenue but we have to continue to keep up production to ensure we have product when we reopen. It would help us meet payroll, utilities, and expenses. And another member said on the income tax question, we need time to figure out longer term, like a year, the impacts of COVID-19. Delaying tax payments gives us some more time to figure this out. Not delaying tax payments would require us to make worst case assumptions now. And then when asked about uh, property tax payments, we heard the following. The payment is a considerable amount of cash we would have to pay out and due to COVID-19, we have not had our normal sales or cash flow. So we would either have to make payroll cuts or other expenses to make this payment possible. Another member said our sales are down 20% in March and we expect that to keep dropping. Even if our customers pay us on time, we will have less cash to pay people and their benefits. We are trying not to lay off any employees that didn't volunteer already to be laid off. And last comment I wanted to share is, I'm a seasonal shop facing a delayed opening. Paying property taxes would significantly pinch my operating funds when I am in the midst of using what I set aside for opening capital with no replenishment. So a couple of specific requests, and I think uh, President Kashkari teed up this conversation beautifully by saying, you know, the the more immediate help you can provide to small businesses, first dollar in is better than a loan program on the backside when they might not even be able to access it. So just on taxes specifically, uh, at the state and local level, there are large tax payments that are coming due within the next 42 days. 
This includes the 2019 and first quarter 2020 income tax payments due on April 15th. And the second big tax payment is the first half of the annual property tax payment due on May 15th. So the first thing that we would like you to consider is conforming with the federal tax extension for the April 15th income tax payments to July 15th. The federal government applied the extension to extension to all taxpayers for both the 2019 April 15th income tax payment and the first quarter 2020 estimated tax payment. Um, in Minnesota, the payment extension was made for individual income taxpayers, but did not include some businesses um, paying at the entity level. So uh, subtrapper S corporations, C corps, partnerships, LLCs. Second, uh, we would ask you to enact a 60 day extension of the May 15th property tax payment for business owners without incurring penalties and interest. Uh, we recommend state action on property taxes so there's uniformity across the state versus a county by county approach. Now, counties have the statutory authority to do property tax abatements under current law, and the state has statutory authority to, ter to, to determine payment schedules. Um, these actions would be incredibly helpful for continuity of operations while allowing time for businesses to access federal resources. I just want to be clear, we're not, we're not asking for payments not to be made. We're asking for time for businesses to be able to continue to have cash, to pay employees, to pay benefits, to pay operating costs, and then access the federal dollars that um, Commissioner Grove referenced. Um, in addition, and this would be for longer term considerations when you're back in session, is passage by the end of session for uh, economic recovery, uh, federal conformity with tax items that were passed in the CARES bill. It's a very big bill. There might be some state action needed there. Conformity with section 179 expensing rules and June accelerated sales tax payments, payment remittance. And we understand there's a lot of unknowns at this time. This is a very dynamic situation. So we may have some additional requests coming forward. The last thing I've been asked to convey to you is the importance of testing. Uh, employers are, are so concerned about keeping their workforces healthy and safe. And we would just ask as, as soon as the first responders, the healthcare providers and employees dealing directly with the public and patients on COVID-19, that we speed availability of testing for workers in, in critical industries that are so important societally. I know that's a big ask, um, but it's something that a lot of employers are concerned about is keeping their workplace healthy and safe so they can keep uh, providing the services that we all rely on. So with that, um, I'd be happy to answer any questions, but I just wanna convey to you how much we appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about what our members are telling us and your sensitivity to business concerns. We're, we're very grateful for that. Well, thank you, Laura. Sarah Gazalka, I think you had a question. Yeah, uh, first of all, Laura, thank you for uh, what you're doing and, and the many, many, many uh, job providers that you represent. Uh, the Section 179 and the June Accelerator, we have an opportunity yet to do that this session. I know Senator Chamberlain has that in his uh, uh, bill that he wants to put forward. And even those two really are just to um, make, make, they're not really about paying less taxes, they're just about paying them differently. And so I'll, I'll see what we can do on that. And then one other one that I hope we would consider is the first half business property taxes. One third of that goes to the general fund fund to the state and it would be nice if we can find a way to waive that this first half because even out July 15th it's still a big bill that's going to have to be paid with not a lot of resources coming in yet okay uh next we have Senator Rest and then Senator Kent Senator Rust you're on mute Senator Rust you're on mute there we go no I'm not thank you very much uh Senator uh uh, Senator Pratt, you know, when we look at the uh, burdens that are being uh, faced by both families and businesses, we have to balance um, the business concerns with the, the concerns and the obligations of their, uh, of their employees. And although it is true that the extension of the individual tax payments uh, for individuals is a uh, time delay payment of some $1.4 billion. When we start um, delaying 
other kinds of payments, we are um, exhausting uh, not only the payments that are going to be coming in from the federal government, but we're going to be exhausting Minnesota's reserves. And I think that we have to be very cautious, um, even as we are sympathetic, not only to Minnesota businesses, but to the families that work for them in what kinds of relief we give and really pay attention to the time value of money, just as the businesses are doing. And we have been um, very concerned that um, just as the businesses do not want to make estimated payments in April based on 2019 income, we also know that individuals are um, continuing to pay uh, withholding on their incomes, even as they see them, um, they see them uh, fall off. So I think we just need to be uh, comprehensive. We need to uh, look at every iron that's in the fire, all the tools, and to be um, to very, uh, very careful about uh, and and data based uh, on what kinds of relief and the time value of money that we're going to not only offer Minnesota businesses, but also uh, Minnesota families, again, that work for them, and the uh, reserve accounts that keeps Minnesota going. Uh, I appreciate um, Ms. Bordelin's um, comments. I've had these conversations with Senator Chamberlain um, in addition, and um, I think we're all committed to uh, being um, intelligent um, and strategic about how we uh, provide uh, the best kind of recovery uh, opportunities, again, not only for businesses, but for the families that work for them. Uh, but I appreciate Ms. Bordelin's um, comments. They're not new to any of us, but uh, we realize how important they are. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rust. Uh, Ms. Bordelin, any thoughts or comments to that? Um, I would I would simply encourage you to have a sense of urgency. Um, businesses are really struggling. We want to keep people employed. Um, we don't want workers to unattach from businesses. Um, when, when Commissioner Grove talks about all the various benefits that employees get, health care, the leave, all the different, uh, you know, 401k, all of those benefits, we want to we want to retain as much of that as possible. But businesses need some breathing room, um, given the unprecedented economic hardships that they're dealing with right now. Okay, thank you. Next, we have Senator Kent. Thank you, Mr. Chair and um, Ms. Bordelon. I want to thank you for being here and for adding your comments. Um, I particularly want to um, uh, acknowledge what you were saying about the importance of testing. Um, I think we all know that if we had better testing capabilities, that we could probably be more nuanced in some of the responses that we're making. But because we are just working in the dark here, uh, it has forced us to take pretty broad measures in order to um, make sure we're doing the best po possible job we can to, to protect everybody and to stop the spread of this disease. And what I would incur, and I would also add that I think a lot of this goes to the conversation as well about personal protective equipment. And here in Minnesota, we're doing everything we can to give the administration the tools they need, both on the testing side and on the personal protective equipment. That too goes to the ability to stop the spread of this illness, which ultimately means we will be able to, to come out of this hopefully quicker and in a stronger position and um, as we cross this bridge that people keep, I think, appropriately referring to. And I would just encourage you and your organization and other organizations, and I don't know if President Pashkari is still here, but him as well, we need a much stronger federal response here. And um, we need your voices to, to help carry that message because that is really what is gonna make a difference, not only here in Minnesota, but across this country, because it is it is crucial to how we're gonna be able to, to get through this quickly and, and, and in as strong a position as possible. Uh, Senator Rosen, do you have a question? I do, I have a question. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Laura, for being here. Uh, I can't imagine what you're, you and your organization are trying to field right now with, with all the requests. And that, that's kind of my question is how, this is moving obviously so very quickly, 
like the Paycheck Protection Program just got approved uh, last night, as you said, I did not realize that. How do you get that information out? And are you, are you able to get to all the businesses? And um, how is this working with communicating to, to all these small businesses? And what is the, the vehicle for them to acquire this information that's these tools that are becoming available? Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Rosen. Um, I can tell you we have had unprecedented traffic through our communications channels. There's so much desire for information and we are updating our own uh, websites and channels as frequently as we can. Part of the challenge is things are, things are super dynamic and changing. So when we um, get guidance from the, from the Treasury Department as late as last night, and I think lenders are struggling to figure out what are the forms? How much credit worthiness do we have to examine for paycheck protection? How do businesses provide the appropriate documentation for things like payroll, utilities, uh, uh, other operating costs? Um, this will all be unbelievably helpful when businesses can access it. But even the banks right now are trying to figure out how to open the gates and let people through. And um, which goes to my, again, you know, em emphasis on timing is businesses need time while the wheels of state and federal government turn and, and get access to folks. So I would recommend a couple of things. You know, the, the Department of Economic Development of the state has some wonderful links. They really, their website is very robust. They have great FAQs. I would recommend all of your constituent businesses to look there. The Minnesota Chamber's information is wide open. It's not, uh, it's not, there's no gate there. People can look at that. Um, there's some guidance at the federal level, but it's um, it's complicated. And you know, depending upon how you want to accept a loan and use a loan, the gate that you go through changes. So I think the uh, one of the best places to go is your local lender and also deed. Um, they understand the mechanics of SBA. Uh, they understand how some of these PPP loans will be used, but, to Senator Gazelka's first point is your local lenders are gonna have the most information about how to access the loan and if they're offering them. Okay, we have uh, our last question from Senator Benson and then uh, we'll move on to Ms. Ruley. And Ms. Bordelon, I wanted to clarify, do you mean the serological testing so that this fall, if the virus comes back or as um, we loosen the stay at home restrictions that you can test employees to see which ones are not going to contract this illness? Or do you mean that the, um, the RNA based testing that's going on to see if people actually have contracted COVID? Mr. Chair and Senator Benson, um, you know, none of our members were that specific. They just said testing. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't be more clear to you. I think they just want to make sure they keep operating in, in critical essential industries and that their workforce is safe. So I can I can follow up with you and, and get more specifics if you like. I would appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Mandy uh, Ruley uh, from Minnesota uh, Play Cafe. Welcome to the committee. Hi, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Majority Leader Gazelka, members of the COVID-19 Response Working Group. My name is Mandy Bully, and I am the owner and CEO of the Minnesota Play Cafe in Champlin. I have not always been in the business world. I've worked in government and the nonprofit sector. Um, but a couple of years ago, when I was seven months pregnant, I saw the need for, <laughs> sorry, I saw the need in the community, and it consumed me. An amazing cafe for caretakers to relax and a small, clean, creative play space for kids to explore. After my son was born, I walked into the city of Maple Grove with my fancy bomb business plan and declared I was going to open a business. They set me up with Rob from Open to Business, and my journey began. From there, I drained my 401k, my personal savings, took out an SBA loan, and worked night and day to open Minnesota Play Cafe. We opened on November 14th of 2018. And I had no idea what I was doing. I just knew I was doing it. Open a business was a huge help to me, but opening a business is truly like having a baby. You have no idea what it's really going to be like until you hold it in your hands. Being a new concept startup without any business partners, I took some time to refine my processes and get an understanding of my customers and systems. This winter, we finally found our groove. 
And then on March 13th, the first day of Noka Hennepin spring break, should have begun our busiest five-week stretch of the year. Instead, we were told to close our doors a couple days later. Now, instead of bringing in revenue that would have got us through the slow summer months, we are offered the opportunity to apply for loans to cover our operating costs. This doesn't work for me. I'm aware and I'm applying for the forgivable SBA loans, but it won't replace the gross profit that I was going to make that would have helped me get through those months of summer. It just isn't enough. We're innovating as best as we can for the type of business that we are. One of my amazing laid off staff members, Cassie, came up with a great idea to create sensory bins, craft kits, and lattes that would be available for curbside pickup. And it's going well, our community is supporting us, but it still is not gonna be enough. I became a business owner to create a community for caretakers. I became a business owner because I thought my success would be determined by the merit of my ideas, the savvy of my marketing, and the happiness of my customers. I became a business owner because the confidence that I had in my own ability to succeed outweighed my fear of failure. I became a business owner knowing that there would be incredible stress and risk and that I would expose my family to, or that I would expose my family to, but the trade-offs would be worth it in the end. I became a business owner because never in my wildest dreams did I believe that my idea of a children's play cafe would be considered a danger to society and closed by an executive order for reasons far beyond my control. And here we are today with all of those reasons why I became a business owner have been stolen from me. My daughter, Mary, is five years old, and she was asked something she was doing on Tuesday, what she wanted to be when she grew up. And she said, I want to be an oak business owner with my mom. And when I heard her say it under my breath, I just said, no, you don't. And it broke my heart to say that because this is why I was doing it. It was for my kids. Given what has happened to small businesses in the last three weeks, I can't imagine that this would be something that she would barely want, voluntarily want to do when she grows older. If the government doesn't do more for small businesses right now, it is going to kill off the American entrepreneurial spirit living within our next generation. I'm here today to ask you to provide additional support for small businesses. I'm not looking for a handout, just a way to recoup the lost revenue as a result of the crisis. I, along with other small businesses in Minnesota, am working hard to be creative and frugal to make up for the losses. I've also been advocating for myself and small businesses by working with Representative Robbins in the Minnesota House and his policy staff at MCCD. However, if the legislature allocates even the $10 million that we're asking for and grants of forgivable loans, I still don't believe it's going to be enough. After speaking with some people at MCCD, I was told that they've already received 440 applications and they will likely to be able to help less than 50 of them. Now, small businesses like mine are the spirit of Minnesotan communities and failure to provide adequate support will have lasting economic consequences. Thank you all for the opportunity to testify today and I hope there's more help coming from the state to support our small businesses. We take care of our communities and families every single day. And we're just hoping that this, during this once in a lifetime crisis, we are asking the government to help take care of us. I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for your story. Do we have any questions for on this ruling? Okay, I'm not seeing any, so we're gonna go ahead and move on, but please hang out because there might be some questions here at the end if we, uh, if we get them. Uh, next we have uh, Tim Maluli with the Nursery and Landscape Association. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I hope you can hear me. We can. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon and thank you for inviting Forrest Sear originally who had to attend a, to a call with the Commissioner of Agriculture. My name is Tim Maluli and I'm a longtime member of the Minnesota Nursery and Landscape Association. I currently serve as its president. MNLA is a 95 year old business trade association representing what we affectionately call the original green industry. I personally own three businesses, all related to water, uh, employing about 50 persons. Two have field operations and were placed on pause before uh, the industry learned of its non-exempt status uh, per the governor's current order. Uh, I've chosen to pay staff, but I can't sustain this decision. We made application for PPP and we're reapplying since forms were changed overnight. Uh, we will consider uh, IDLA depending on what happens in a week or so. Our industry represents several billion dollars to Minnesota's economy. It's largely comprised of small family owned enterprises and employs about 45,000 persons who grow, sell, design, construct, and maintain our outdoor living environment. A little more specifically, the members include wholesale nursery growers, retail nurseries and garden centers, commercial flower growers, landscape contractors, 
uh, irrigation folks, uh, landscape and landscape management services, professional gardening services, commercial arborists and tree care services, and snow and ice management service providers. We also maintain relationships with individuals and organizations that operate golf, sports facilities, cemeteries, and parks. To help maintain calm among the industry, staff and I are in constant touch with members during the COVID-19 action, and we make information available to anyone, member or not, via direct communications, mnla.biz, and a COVID-19 Facebook page. While some of our members may operate year-round, uh, the primary source of income to all of our member businesses is derived of a highly condensed time frame. Business undertaken in the second quarter of the calendar year, right now, is critical to the entirety of the industry, supply chain, retail venues, boots on the ground practitioners, and, and others defining whether they will prosper each year. Our industry cannot make up for lost time due to the seasonal nature of its work. Regarding the current actions to reduce effects of COVID-19, decisions we make today and in the next week will likely determine whether a large proportion of our industry survives at all. Thinking positively, uh, many of our non-field-based green industry employees can and are working from home. The construction segment of the green industry is currently exempt from the order uh, and implemented safe work guidance from CDC and other sources. Critical services furnished by our industry includes work to maintain safety to the public and at critical facilities, including tree care and snow and ice folks. Also thinking positively, much of the field work performed by green industry employees is solitary and can be completed at safe distances from one another. To help maintain, uh, excuse me, uh, the CDC and related safety guidance is already being implemented by our industry in, in, in anticipation of, being, of gaining permission to work very soon. Some grower retail sales outlets largely crippled by the current order have taken action to enable safe delivery style transactions. But with impending warm weather and consumer population excited to work outdoors, our retail members are also taking steps to implement safe transactions in the hope the governor will soon approve of our industry to, be, to reopen. Our industry is hiring. We have openings throughout the industry and all over the state, and we welcome the ability to put people to work safely, largely outdoors, and to furnish services critical to maintaining our outdoor environment. Thank you. I'll be very happy to take questions, Mr. Chair, if any are offered. Yeah, thank you. Do we have any questions for Mr. Maluli? Uh, Senator Rust. And Mr. Mullooly, I just wanted you to know that um, when I knew that you were going to testify today, I went to your website and um, read through all of the advisories that you're giving your your members and your employees, and and how impressed I I was uh, with them. And I would recommend them to other members of of this committee. I thought they were very thoughtful. Um, they were very um, compelling to me. And um, I do hope that we see some improvement um, moving forward with how um, uh, the members of the green industry, which I agree it is, um, are, uh, are able to uh, help, um, um, help our families again and help, um, and help um, businesses in, in our community. So I, I um, thank you for your updates, your COVID-19 updates and resources. They were very enlightening to me as a legislator. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Chair, Senator Rest, thank you very much. It's very kind of you. Uh, yeah, as you can see, all of our updates to members uh, at mnla.biz and its COVID-19 page. Thank you very much. That was very kind of you. Okay, do we have any other questions for Mr. Maluli? Okay, seeing none, uh, we have Janet Leonard of Styles on Cliff. Welcome, welcome, and feel free to begin when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the committee. My name is Janet Leonard. I'm the owner operator of Styles on Cliff, a boutique, a boutique hair salon in Burnsville. As an owner operator, I have run into some challenges accessing the financial relief for small businesses. On March 18th, I applied on the UIMN website for unemployment only to find out that I qualified for zero dollars. They needed more information. My W-2, M-1, and 1040, which I mailed out on March 20th. I understand that the relief package, including the self-employment, just passed, but I've gone to the website daily and nothing has changed. I still qualify for zero dollars. 
If we are self-employed, do we have to reapply for the unemployment? There is no answer on the website and you cannot get through on the phone. So I just continue to check the website daily. I filled out the application for relief on the SBA website on March 21st when Minnesota was added to the list of states that could apply. I received a confirmation email they that they received my application. I have not heard anything since. On March 30th, I filled out another application on the SBA website, this time for a $10,000 grant. I received a confirmation number upon completion of the application. I have not heard anything since. The SBA has changed their website. You no longer can log in to check the status of your loan or grant. So I do not know where either one of these stand. I'm aware there is another loan you can start applying for today on April 3rd to help with payroll. My salon is an S Corp, so I am paid by payroll. Do I apply for a loan to continue to, and do I apply for that loan or do I continue to wait for unemployment from the state? I have not sold any products or gift certificates for fear that any income generated will avoid my eligibility for any of these grants or loans. I have now gone 16 days without any income into the business or ability to pay myself. I cannot pay bills at my business or at my home. I have filled out all of the federal and state paperwork I can, yet I do not know if I qualify for any of it. And if I do qualify for it, how much will I get? And when will the financial help finally be available to all, all of us small businesses that we've been promised for so many weeks? Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Janet? Uh, Janet, um, you know, I'll follow up with you offline, but, uh, uh, you know, we, we need to make sure we're working really hard to make sure that the resources do get out and are available, at least the resources that we have available to us. And so, uh, yeah, I listened to what the commissioner had to say and, and it does sound promising. It's just incredibly frustrating that you can't get an answer on any of it. There's no follow up. There's no way to check on progress. There's there's just no answers. You you don't even know how much money you're applying for half the time. You just fill up the paperwork and there you sit and wait. I understand. I understand. I know how frustrating that can be. I, I know you and I have talked about it before. Yeah. Any any other questions for Ms. Leonard? Uh Senator Rosen. Sarah Rosen, you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thank you, Janet, for your testimony. And as more of a comment, I think I read someplace where this has disproportionately hit females. And um, yeah. I, I could see how that has happened. So we owe everyone a, a more expedited answer to their questions. I mean, I, people understand there is there's a level of sacrifice here, but uh, you you deserve an answer. But I do have a question too for um, Ms. Malodi, Mr. Malodi, is that how you say your last name, Tim? Oh, you're on mute too. Oh. Sorry about you're that. On, there you go, um, thank you. Senator Rosen, um, Maluli. Maluli, thank you, I can't, I can't read my own screen. <laughs> uh -huh. um, so I brought up the question to the commissioner about the golf courses and the maintenance and it and it uh, and then senators rest comments about your website and your um, your approach to the COVID-19 has other industries looked into this um, is is there a way to perhaps share their your approach and your precautionary measures to these other industries because I really think we have an opportunity to readjust on on a lot of this uh, shutdown of industries that perhaps if they have precautionary measures in place, we, it's not necessary to shut them down. Uh, it's very kind of you. Uh, right now, uh, uh, the the circumstances are that, that we are currently shut down. We're taking measures uh, across our industry. I know the folks that, that are focused on golf, for example, uh, have also uh, demonstrated their willingness uh, to take measures as needed to demonstrate safe operation. Uh, 
especially as regards maintaining these investments, as uh, as I think it was me that put that earlier. These are investments. The outdoor living environment is an asset that we have to protect. And and the other thing about it, respectfully, is that it's a growing and living asset. We can't control it or shut it off for a little while while we get through this unprecedented event. We do have to take care of it. Um, and yes, our information is available to anybody. You can go yourself as an individual to the website that uh, was referenced by Senator Rest and take a look for yourself. And we're not owning the information. We're just trying to help uh, maintain calm and reason through uh, a very, very challenging circumstance. I mean, people are indeed dying of this problem, and we recognize that. By the same token, however, we believe our industry uh, can function safely and can uh, address some of the uh, soon to happen pent up need to take care of our, our environment. Thank you. Uh, Senator Benson, did you have a question? Okay, uh, Senator Benson is not. Um, with that, why don't we move on uh, uh, to Joel, uh, I hope I pronounced your right, name right, Vickery, um, with uh, Vickery Distillery. Welcome, uh, welcome to the working group. Uh, please uh, feel free to begin when you're ready. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, hello, Senators, I'm Joel Vikra. The pronunciation was close. Uh, <laughs> Co-founder with my wife, Emily, of Vikra Distillery in Duluth. I'm also the legislative chair of the Minnesota Distillers Guild, which represents over 20 micro distilleries in our state. Our distillery in Duluth employed 35 people. When our cocktail room was shut, along with all bars and restaurants in the state, we were forced to furlough 25 of our employees. Like most craft distilleries, our cocktail room was the only cash flow positive part of our business and the most staff intensive. The foundation of the cocktail room and the remaining part of our business is manufacturing distilled spirits for sale through distribution. With our cocktail room closed and restaurants and bars closed, our business is reduced to sales to liquor stores. Though sales at liquor stores have seen a significant bump, our distributor has begun to curb ordering because of uncertainty. Because of how the law is structured, they are our only customer right now. We can't self-distribute, and we can only sell one 375 ml bottle per person per day to consumers. So even though sales of our product to liquor stores are continuing, we had to furlough six more employees yesterday. And my wife and I have taken an 80% pay cut without knowing if we'll be able to receive unemployment compensation. Distilleries across the state are in exactly the same position. We have pivoted, as have 16 other distilleries in Minnesota, to producing hand sanitizer, which we are providing either free or at reduced cost to individuals, hospitals, nursing homes, homeless shelters, first responders, grocery stores, liquor stores, and many others across the state. This has largely been done out of pocket as a community service. At Vikra Distillery, we've donated over a thousand gallons of sanitizer so far. We thank the departments of health and public safety, as well as our federal regulators for making this quick pivot possible. We are incredibly grateful for all the work that has been done to help our furloughed employees by improving unemployment insurance. insurance. We are benefiting from the reduction in existing SBA loan payments, and we are applying to the PPP and disaster loan programs as well. If we and other distilleries across the state are to survive this crisis and return to full employment, we need at least a temporary adjustment to the laws that separate us from our customers. We need the limit on bottle size and on number of bottle sales lifted. We are paying staff and keeping the doors open to give away hand sanitizer to individuals and institutions. We ought to be able to sell our product to those people. And we are asking to be able to ship directly to customers to allow people to get our products without leaving their homes for public safety reasons. And as our distributors are affected by circumstances beyond their control and are cutting back on inventory and not accepting new products, particularly those distributors that rely mostly on on-premise accounts, we need to be able to sell directly to liquor stores as well. These needs parallel requests from the brewers in Minnesota and numerous states have made similar changes to allow their craft alcohol producers to survive COVID-19, most recently Iowa. We're a small industry, 40-some family businesses employing a few hundred people in the state, but we have an outsized impact on agriculture and tourism. We represent a movement toward more sustainable local supply chains. And in a crisis like this, the value of local supply chains is more clear and more worthy of protection than ever. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Vikra. Um, I, we have a question from Senator Rosen. No, not Senator Rosen. <laughs> any, uh, any questions for Mr. Vikra? I do. Uh, Senator Rustin and Senator Chamberlain. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Pratt. Uh, Mr. Vikra, are other distilleries um, currently involved in the same kind of activity of making um, um, sanitizer? And are you finding a ready market for that? And is the state helping you in any way as a, uh, a conduit to that market? And I realize it is not, uh, it's not your calling. I understand that, but um, uh, are others doing that? And um, uh, how can the state be helpful to you um, and, uh, and Dean and Commissioner Grove and any of us for that matter mm -hmm. in um, finding a, um, a market? Because we know that the need is not going away anytime soon, um, even though many of us wish that you could open your uh, your distillery in the business that you are called to. Right. Well, it's not as far from my calling as you'd think. My background is in public health. Um, oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> but the we tried to count this morning. I think there's 17 distilleries producing sanitizer right now. Um, and it is something that um, I can just speak from our to the finances of it for us personally. Um, you know, we, we saw, hey, there's a need, and here's a resource that we have, which is alcohol, and we have the licenses to process alcohol, so we ought to do that. Um, and immediately upon announcing it, we were, our first call was from the, the police department, and I was like, oh, no, we're going to get in trouble for something here. Um, and they said, hey, we really need sanitizer. Um, so that was followed by um, everyone all the way up to the Mayo Clinic. So we've given away to hospitals, to police, to the counties, several of the counties surrounding St. Louis County as well, nursing homes, um, uh, a lot of group homes and kind of places that are living on sort of much more limited budgets right now, um, jails. Um, and so there's a real need for it. We, after going through a thousand gallons, um, we had to source, uh, the sourcing of bulk alcohol right now is really challenging. We had to source a big amount. So we went to a kind of a pre-order system. Um, so we're processing orders now in anticipation of having more available on the 10th. Um, it's something, I don't think it's a thing that's gonna make us a bunch of money, but it is hopefully a thing that allows us to keep the lights on. We have a crew of uh, four people working full time still, um, our production staff and, um, you know, we still got to pay our rent. We still got to pay insurance. We sit, there's a lot of things that didn't turn off. You know, our revenue turned off, but our expenses did not turn off. So our hope is that that can keep us going and meet this need. Um, there has been one application made to, I think, the governor's COVID task force by a group of distilleries to try and create a system for state support of sanitizer. Um, I don't know exactly the status on that, and I wasn't directly involved, but I know that that ask has been made. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Senator Chamberlain, and then we're gonna have to wrap it up, folks. Um, we've got a hard stop coming up. Senator Chamberlain. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Thank you to all the testifiers, including um, those uh, that preceded the business owners. I, I guess it's more of a quick comment and statement that uh, certainly appreciate we all do what all of you do and what you go through to run your businesses and it takes to start it up the uh, sweat the blood the tears uh, all all of what you do because you love it you want to do it you want to have success you want to take part in that dream that we have in this country and you're able to do it it is and for your example uh Vickery, mr vickery is that is that you're adapting as well on the fly to do something different that benefits and helps out in the current situation. Uh, it is vital and it's been repeated, but it needs to be repeated many times. It is vital and critical that all of these businesses stay alive and solvent. What you do and what your employees do is provide the fuel to keep this engine running. 
this engine dies is because our businesses and small businesses especially have failed and they will fail because of this crisis, the COVID crisis. So it is, there's the old question of chicken and egg, which comes first. In this case, I think it's very clear. Employers create employees and that drives the state engine to provide all these services. So if we don't have them producing, how long can they survive on government subsidies on a federal government that is now going to be over 100% debt beyond GDP? So we are committed to the protection of our citizens as well as the protection of our small businesses that would enable us to protect our citizens. So thank you very much. And we will continue here to do all we can for uh, healthcare folks frontline, but also maintain and make sure all of you continue to be solvent so we can continue this work in this great state. Thank you. Uh, before we go, I do want to recognize uh, Senator Champion real quick. Uh, we've got about five minutes left in total, and, and I want to give Senator Gazaka a chance to wrap up. So, Senator Champion, you're on mute, Senator Champion. You know, I was prepared for that, too. Let me just say this. Um, uh, I appreciate all the discussions that have happened today. Thank you, Senator Pratt, for uh, doing such, a, such an amazing job and to everyone who testified today. Um, and we understand that we're all in this together. And I always want to say this because I don't want this to get lost. Uh, we are all in this together, whether you, you are a business owner or you're a worker as the business owner clearly said, and I can appreciate because it resonates with me, is that uh, his business has been hit hard uh, uh, and, and certain things have been turned off, but his expenses were not turned off. And I just want to humanize this to say, absolutely, we know that to be true, and which is why we're working hard. But it's also important for us to remember that the workers uh, who are laid off and furloughed, their expenses didn't shut off neither, right? They still have mortgages and rent to pay and lights and children and food and, and and i don't want us to get in a situation where we are recognizing someone else's pain and not all of our pain because we are in it together and i just want us to remember that that as we work on these things that we work comprehensively in order to make sure that we're meeting as many minnesotans needs as we possibly can that's us thank you thank you and and sir champion I, I you know i think what what one of the things that that's come to me today is that our small business owners aren't just business owners, they are employees. They are as dependent on their jobs as, as everybody who works for someone else. Uh, and we have to keep that in mind. And uh, with that, Senator Gazelka, I'll let you, you know, first of all, let me thank everybody uh, who testified. I know some of them had to sign off, but, but thank you all for your, uh, for your insights today. Um, it, was, it was very, very helpful for me. And, and I think from the questions I've heard most of the, uh, or all of the members of the committee. And so, Senator Gazelka, did you want to wrap us up? Yeah, and thank you, Senator Pratt. Uh, great job moderating, and thank you for all the members and your questions and all the testifiers. And for all the folks that are providing jobs out there, we just want to say we're listening. And my takeaway is, uh, first from Commissioner Grove, is that this is a real and urgent problem with 300,000 unemployment claims in just the last few weeks. We have to pay attention and then from Commissioner Kashkari, or President Kashkari, excuse me, I think the takeaway there was his, his urgency about saving the jobs and the job creators right now is a far better path than letting it all collapse and then try to get it started back again. So I thought that was really important as a takeaway for all of us. From the chamber, uh, the, the biggest challenge for businesses is time. They need more time, and we can do that by delaying a lot of the taxes that are coming due. Uh, businesses are shuddering, waiting on the sidelines for help. We need action now on a short-term basis is what I wrote down. Delay income taxes give us time to figure things out. Property taxes are difficult because the drop in cash flow. Consider extending the April 15th deadline to July 15th. Enact a 60-day extension for the property tax for business owners on a statewide approach uh, so you don't have to assume each county is going to do it. Give small businesses time to keep employees on the payroll. And that's what goes back to 
President Kishkari's comments as well. And then they talked about Section 179, the June Accelerator, and on and on. And then lastly, from the, the, the individual businesses that express concern, we need more common sense in, shut, in these shutdown regulations. Uh, we need to think about who are we asking uh, to close and why. And so as the governor and the House and the Senate work together, we want to pay attention to that. Please keep bringing those concerns up to us, whether you're a golf course, a landscaper, a two-man dock crew that puts docks in. There's so many things that uh, I think we need to open up to. And so, so as you're listening, let us know. If the Senate's not doing their job, let us know. If the House is not doing their job, let them know. And if the governor's not doing his job, let them know. We are all in this together, and, and uh, by God's grace, we'll get through this. So thank you, and that concludes this uh, time. And then for, for next, the next one we're going to do, we have a hearing scheduled for Monday. It'll be focused on state agency budgets ahead of potential 2021 general fund deficit. Commissioner Myron Franz will be joining us. Monday's hearing will be at 11 a.m. And as we continue this process in the coming days and weeks, we'll have other informational hearings as well. So with that, we conclude this session. Thank you for joining us.